Well, hello. My name is John Schiller. I work in the intramural program of the National Cancer Institute. And the topic of this presentation is to address the question of why HPV virus-like particles work so well. This is an extension of the previous talk I gave that described the basic biology of HPV, its association with cancer, in the development of the vaccines. Now, in that talk, I went over some of the evidence of why this vaccine works so well. First of all, it induces long-lasting and virtually complete protection from incident infection and disease by the vaccine-targeted types. And remarkably, it does this even after a single dose. It's the first subunit vaccine that appears to have these characteristics. It induces sterilizing immunity in most subjects so that they never get infected. And this makes it the first sexually first vaccine that's highly effective against a sexually transmitted mucosal infection. So why is it important to try to understand why the vaccine works so well? Well, as somebody who developed, helped develop this vaccine, it's a basic biological interest. I mean, we want to know just for curiosity. But above that, determining why the vaccine works so well provides biological plausibility for the potential of using a single-dose subunit vaccine in the future, and importantly, we hope, would inform development of future subunit vaccines so they could have these same remarkable characteristics as the HPV VLP vaccine. So as most things in, bi in biologies, explanations are multifactorial. But in this case, we think that there are three primary reasons why these vaccines work so well. And I'll be going into the first two in some detail. The first is that the vaccines are exceptionally good at inducing neutralizing antibodies, which we think is the main effector mechanism for the activity of this vaccine. Secondly, the unique infection mechanism that, that HPVs use make them exceptionally susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. And we didn't know either of these things when we first started developing this vaccine. And finally, just basic molecular biology, is that HPVs have DNA genomes. And so they don't rapidly evolve to evade antibody responses. The mutation rate, since they use the cellular machinery to replicate the, the DNA, is basically the same as our own genome. So it's much different than RNA viruses, such as HIV or hepatitis C, where they replicate as a swarm and so trying to inhibit infection, you're basically trying to, to attack a moving target. Now, there are several reasons why we think that antibodies are likely to be the main mediators of immune protection. First of all, high levels of virus-neutralizing antibodies are routinely generated by VLP vaccination. And if we look at the cross-protection seen in the clinical trials against types that are not specifically targeted by the vaccine, it largely mirrors the antibody-mediated cross-protection we see in in vitro assays. And I'll describe those in vitro assays a little bit later. And I think most importantly, that protection from the vaccine can be passively transferred in the serum from a vaccinated animal to a naive animal in animal challenge models. And again, I'll show you some evidence for that a little bit later. Now, this vaccine is remarkably consistent in inducing antibody responses. So this shows the seroconversion rates in women to individual HPV VLP types for the, the, the Merck vaccine, Gardasil. And what you can see is that 100%, basically 100% of women seroconvert to a rounding error for each of the four types in the vaccine. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer on what we expect from antibody responses to different types of situations. And so if you look at the antibody responses to a real virus infection, what you see is that the, the titers go up very rapidly within a few days to weeks. 
and then they, the, the responses start to decay. Initially, quite rapidly, as short-lived plasma cells in the blood die off, but then this is followed over a period of years by the generation of long-lived plasma cells which could, that go to the bone marrow and continually pump out antibodies indefinitely. Now, contrast to this what is normally seen with a subunit vaccine, such as tetanus toxoid or diphtheria toxoid, where, again, you get this early peak in a number of weeks, uh, and then a decay, a rapid decay, and then a slower decay, but the decay keeps going on. We don't reach this plateau phase as we normally see with a real virus infection. Now, the surprising thing is if you look at the antibody response, in this case, over 10 years, to a VLP vaccine, in this case, Cervarex. And what you can see is that, especially in the 15 to 25-year-olds, which are the target for the immunization programs, that after that initial decay, there's a plateau, a stabilization of the antibody responses that, for all the world, looks like a real virus infection. But it's important to, to point out that this is a true subunit vaccine. It's composed of only one protein, 360 copies of the L1 protein that assemble into this virus-like particle. And even more remarkably, we get this stabilization, in this case, out to seven years, the longest we've been able to look, by even a single dose of the HPV vaccine. And if you look at the difference between three doses and one dose, the difference in antibody responses at the plateau stage is only fourfold. And it still remains almost a log higher than what we see after natural infection. Now, this data that I just showed you is from the Costa Rican trial, NCI-sponsored trial, of Cervarex, which contained a more powerful adjuvant, immune-stimulatory uh, molecules, than did, did Gardasil. So it was an interesting question to know whether we could get the same type of stabilization of antibody response after a single dose of Gardasil. And what you can see here is that there's emerging evidence now out to four years um, in an interrupted Indian trial, that Gardasil also can generate a stable antibody resp response despite using a simple aluminum salts adjuvant. And the difference between three, three doses and one dose is, again, only about fourfold. Now, the data I've shown you so far in terms of the antibody response was data that was mostly done with what's called an ELISA which is an in vitro assay that measures antibodies that bind to the antigen, in this case, the VLPs, and so can measure both antibodies that have the ability to inhibit infection and also those that can inhibit infection, that may be low, low binding activity or just not of the right type. And so it's also important to look at the ability of the antibodies induced in these trials to prevent infection. And, in, and to do this, we use what's called an in vitro neutralization assay, which then measures only antibodies that can prevent infection. Now, HPV, real HPVs, you really can't use them in a neutralization assay for two reasons. One, there isn't a good source of the real HPVs. And secondly, if HPVs infect a cell in culture, it doesn't do anything that's easily scored as an infectious event. And so we needed to develop a, a technology of high titer, what we call pseudoviruses, that rather than transmit the real genome, they transmit a marker plasmid, which when the, gene is, the marker gene is expressed is easily scored as an infectious event. And several years ago, we developed a, a, a technology for generating these high titer um, pseudoviruses for use in neutralization assays. I'm just going to go over real quickly how this occurs, because there's a few little tricks involved. So what we do is we transfect with the marker plasmid, which is less than 8 kb, which is the maximum size that can be packaged by the HPV virions. We co-transfect that with a plasmid that contains the genes for the two virion proteins, L1 and L2, and we need both in order to generate infectious particles. The VLPs for vaccination, incidentally, to remind you, are only L1. And 
the trick is, one, we code on modify the, the genes so that they can be more highly expressed because we get rid of negative regulatory elements in the genes that normally restrict expression to terminally differentiated epithelium. And we put it on a plasmid that's too big to package. The other trick is that the, the plasmid we want to have packaged, we want to make lots of copies so we can generate a lot of virus. And so what we put on is the SV40, which is a, a polyomavirus, the origin of replication from that virus, and transfect cells that express SV40T antigen, and so it's able to induce replication of this plasmid. We can get a lot of copies of, of the, the plasmid replicated, packaged by the virus-like particle, and generate, as you can see, very high titer stocks, 10 to the 10th per mil. So one of the interesting things then was, was to look at the relationship between binding antibodies in a neutralization, in, in, a, in a lysa assay, shown on the x-axis, with neutralization titers that presumably correlate better for protection. And what you can see here is that with the three-dose data, that there's a very strong correlation between neutralizing titers and ELISA titers. They're virtually one-to-one. -one. But even more interesting, after a single dose, there's the same relationship. So what we conclude is that the quality of the antibody responses don't increase with boosting. You get just as good a quality antibodies at one dose as with three doses. Another interesting observation we made in these trials is if you look at the antibody avidity, which is the strength, that, which is basically a measure of the strength at which the antibodies, the serum antibodies, bind their target antigen, in this case, the virus-like particles. And the way you measure this is that you, you, you do an ELISA under more and more stringent conditions by wa washing it with, with molecules that are called kaotropes, such as guanidine hydrochloride. And we made this surprising observation that over time, if you look at the three dose, over the first four years, there was a continual increase in the, the affinity of the antibodies for the antigen. But even after a single dose, we get the same type of affinity maturation because at 48 months, there's almost no difference between the affinity measurements for three versus one dose. But then we get a stabilization so that between year four and year seven, there's essentially no difference. But again, part of the reason we think one dose will be able to work well to prevent infection is, again, the quality of the antibody responses doesn't seem to go up with boosting. So from a biological point of view, from an immunological point of view, this is a very interesting observation because we wouldn't expect um, affinity maturation to continue for a long time. So it raises the question, where is this occurring and how is this occurring? And so normally what happens is when you have a naive B cell, it sees the antigen in the prime. It gets activated, goes to the lymph nodes, and goes through what's called a, a germinal center reaction, which increases by inducing hypersomatic mutation, increases the avidity of the antibodies overall. And so if we're getting continued avidity maturation, does that mean that we're getting the VLPs to be maintained on the antigen-presenting cells to B cells in, in the lymph node, the follicular dendritic cells, for four years? Um, it's possible, but we think that's kind of unlikely. But what happens after the germinal center reaction is that you, you generate three types of cells. You generate long-term, short-term plasma blasts in the blood that pump out antibodies for a while and die. You, you generate memory B cells, which are the reserve component, so they don't make antibodies until they're re-exposed to antigen. And then you generate, as I've mentioned, the long-lived plasma cells, um, which are mostly reside in the bone marrow. And our guess is that what we're looking at here is that we're looking at preferential survival of the plasma cells that have gotten strong signals through their B cell receptors for, for survival in the bone marrow niche. Now, the central question that we, we're, we're addressing is why do the virus-like particle vaccines act so differently than your typical subunit vaccines like tetanus or diphtheria toxin. And we believe that the most important feature is that the immune system, especially the B cell compartment, has evolved to recognize the dense repetitive protein array on, that's displayed on these virus-like particles 
as dangerous microbial structures, such that when the B cell receptors, which are just the antibodies that are on the surface of a particular B cell, when they engage monomeric proteins, you generate weak activation signals, generally low-level antibody responses that don't last very long. In contrast, when you oligomerize the B cell receptors by their interaction with highly repetitive antigens, like the virus-like particles, this leads to strong survival and proliferation signals, high levels of antibodies, and long durations. So we believe that this oligomerization of the B cell receptor by the antigen is key for inducing long-lived plasma cells. And there was, the hypothesis was actually made, interestingly enough, by um, Bachman and Zinkernagel, basically about the same time, the same year that we developed the virus-like particles, that B cells specifically recognize particulate antigens with epitope spacing of 50 to 100 angstroms. Because this spacing is common on microbial surfaces, for instance, the viral sh virus shell, like our VLPs, or, or on bacterial components like bacterial protein. But protein complexes with this spacing rarely, if ever, occur in, ver in vertebrate animals, at least on surfaces that are exposed to the systemic immune system. And so you can sort of think of the B cell receptors as having been evolved as antigen-specific pattern recognition receptors. Now, VLPs also do other good things in addition to sending strong signals through the B cell receptor. They have just the right size for efficient trafficking to lymph node where they can engage B cells and T cells to start an immune response. They're preferentially and readily phagocytized um, by, by antigen-presenting cells because of their size and so that they induce strong T helper responses. And lastly, their polyvalency leads to stable binding of natural low avidity IgM and also complement in that normally if you had a monomeric antigen, um, this low avidity natural IgM would just fall off. But because you have five surfaces that now can be engaged, it's going to have a semi-stable complex which, which has been shown to promote their acquisition by follicular dendritic cells and prime an antibody response. Now, it's important to point out that not all virus-like particle vaccines are, are created equally with regard to the immune response. So a good example of this is the hepatitis V vaccine, which is a very good vaccine, but if you look at the response in humans or in animals, it's not as immunogenic as the HPV VLP vaccine. For instance, one dose induces a poor antibody response in many individuals. And even if you give three doses, the titers continue to wane over time. But the reason this vaccine works well is that it induces a good memory response. And so that if you do get exposed to hepatitis B, it may induce a little bit of an infection because you don't have enough onboard antibodies from long-lived plasma cells. But these memory B cells kick in, generate a whole bunch of plasma blasts that generate new antibodies that control infections so it protects from disease, if not initial infection. And so it's interesting to think about why the HPV structure works really well and the hepatitis B vaccine structure doesn't work so well. And the structure is shown here. Um, and there are quite a few differences between the two structures. For instance, the hepatitis B particles has far fewer repeats, 24 spikes as opposed to 360 copies of an element. So there, there may be too fewer repeats. It's, it's floating in a lipid membrane rather than being very rigid and structural, and so that this may, may inhibit the cross-linking of the B cell receptors. It may simply be too small. It's 22 nanometers versus 55 nanometers for an HPV. And also, the key antigenic determinants may not all be folded correctly when it's made in the hetero, heterologous systems, for instance, in yeast, where most of the hepatitis B vaccines are made. So to conclude the HPV immunogenicity, we, you know, we think that the, VLP, the, the HPV vaccine is so immunogenic because of the VLP structure. And perhaps we've had too low of expectation of VLP vaccines in the future because these expectations were based on simple subunit vaccines 
that take mul multiple doses to protect and don't protect long term without boosts. But maybe the VLP should be compared to acute virus infections and effect of live virus vaccines that also have the high density virus light display of their surface elements and in some cases can protect even after a single dose. So now turning to the virology of the system. As I described in my last talk, HPV viruses have a very unusual life cycle in which they can only produce their virions, complete their life cycle in a stratified squamous epithelia. And so again, the reason they do this presumably is because these virus structures are very immunogenic. And by delaying expression and assembly until the terminal differentiation of the epithelium, where they're not under close immune surveillance, they're able to avoid induction of a potent neutralizing antibody response and also T cell responses to the, to the particles. And so because of this, the virions are seldom exposed to the systemic immunity. They, they, their escape mechanism is essentially ignorance. And so now this becomes the, the, H, the, the, the heel, Achilles heel of the virus because the virus has not evolved defenses against systemic exposure of their virion components. For instance, which we can readily do by taking these virus-like particles and injecting them parentally intermuscularly. So one of the questions that came up when we were developing this, this vaccine is how could the antibodies we generate by this vaccine, which are systemic, they're mostly IgG floating around in the blood, protect against a local mucosal infection, for instance, of the cervical genital tract. Um, as many of you know, the protection at most mucosal sites is mainly mediated by IgA. And systemic immunization is very poor in inducing IgA. Now we think that this vaccine can protect from local mucosal infection by two basic mechanisms. First of all, the cervical vaginal tract is unusual in that about half the antibodies in cervical vaginal mucus is actually IgG, which is delivered across the epithelium by the, the neonatal FC receptor, which is in the epithelial tissue of the cervical vaginal tract. Incidentally, it's the same receptor that functions to pump antibodies from the mother to the fetus across the placenta. Um, and the other mechanism that we think that actually may be more relevant is the fact that in order for this virus to infect, it has to, to enter through sites of trauma because it needs to initially bind the basement membrane that divides an intact epithelium from the underlying dermal compartment. In a minute, I'll explain why we think that, that this needs to be the case. And so when the virus has to bind the basement membrane, it'll be exposed to direct exudation of interstitial and capillary antibodies at the site of trauma. And we think that that is actually the main reason how the vaccine works, in part because the vaccine is very good at protecting against genital warts that are caused by HPV 6 and 11. And many of those occur on, on cornified skin that isn't covered by mucus. So we know that this second mechanism must be sufficient for protection. To show how the virus actually infects its target tissue, the cervical vaginal epithelium, we developed a mouse model. And in this mouse model, um, what we do is that we infect with these HPV pseudoviruses. For instance, we can infect ones with red fluorescent protein, so you can see the fluorescent tissue um, or individual cells microscopically. Or we can infect with pseudovirus that expect luciferase, and by putting in the substrate for luciferase, luciferin, we can see that uh, whether we have infection or not. And what we found is that in order to get infection, we need to get physical or chemical disruption of the tissues. And so the question was, well, why do we need to disrupt the tissue in order to get infection? And this is one of the more surprising things I, I found in all my studies of, of papillomaviruses, in that if you looked at intact tissue, whether they're stratified squamous epithelium or simple columnar epithelia, there's absolutely no binding to intact tissue. 
Now, in the, the virus is shown here in, red, in green because we use a little trick where we can label it with the fluorescent eye um, that emits green upon excitation. And if we get infection, we can, we, the cells turn red because we transduce the RFP gene. So where the cells are is green in the next few slides. Where we get infection, the cells are red. But what we found is that as soon as we disrupted the epithelium, there was very strong binding to the basement membrane that separates the epithelium from the dermis. You can see it lights up like a Christmas tree. And it's, it's really remarkable that even the basal lateral surface of the epithelium, which is just below the word epithelium in the left-hand panel, there's absolutely no binding initially. But after a, a relatively long period, about a day, you can see that there's now, shown by the arrows in the middle panel, there's now transfer to the cells. And in a, a period that, again, takes between two and three days, we can start to see infected cells that are shown in red. And so, to make a long story short, we went on and characterized this process and why does it need to bind the basement membrane? What happens? And how does it eventually infect the, the, the keratinocytes? And so what happens is that initially, the virus could only bind to specifically modified forms of heparin sulfate proteoglycans that are on the basement membrane but not on apical surfaces or basal lateral surfaces of epithelial cells. This induces a conformation change in the capsid which exposes the minor capsid protein, L2, which is shown in yellow here, um, to cleavage by a protease called furin. And this causes the external portion of L2 to flip out of the way, expose a binding site on the major capsid protein, L1, that can now engage a keratinocyte-specific receptor and do infection. But the important point of, of in terms of antibody-mediated protection is that this whole process takes hours. This is by far the slowest infecting virus we've ever come across. Most viruses infect in seconds to minutes. And so it provides an extremely long opportunity for antibodies to interrupt that process. And we actually then went on and looked to see, if you take a vaccinated animal, what happens to the virus if you put it in the, in the female genital tract um, in comparison to, to, to no antibodies? So mice, incidentally, generate about the same titers of antibodies as humans, so it's kind of a good model. And so shown on the left, you can see that that's what happens in a mock vaccinated animals where you see strong binding to the basement membrane. In the middle, you see what happens um, to the particles in a mouse that had been vaccinated. And you can see you get these little funky dots all over, um, some on the tissue, some not. And we found by doing co-staining with other markers that mainly where those viruses are or is that they're attached to neutrophils and monocytes macrophages. So we think that what happens that in the normal levels of antibodies that would be induced um, in a woman, that they're enough to coat the virus such that it can interact with the basement membrane. And in floating around, the, the antibodies, the constant region of the antibodies serve as handlebars, and they get gobbled up by these phagocytic cells. Now, one thing we were interested in, then, is what happens when the antibody titers get lower at the plateau stage? And will the fourfold difference between the antibody titers between three and one dose influence the long-term protection. And to do this, we did what are called passive transfer experiments. So we vaccinated a rabbit with the VLPs, took out the sera, and then diluted that sera, transferred it to a naive mouse that hadn't been vaccinated, and then challenged that mouse with the pseudoviruses and asked the question, how much can the sera from the rabbit be diluted and still protect against high-dose intervaginal challenge with our pseudovirus. And this result was the most surprising result I think I've ever had in my career. And what we found is that we dilute the sera, even if you dilute the serum 10,000-fold, you can still get protection from high-dose challenge. So that rabbit, the antibody concentration in that rabbit was 10,000 times higher than it needed to protect in that particular animal. So, rabbits produce about 10 times higher responses than mice or humans, 
And so from this, we would predict that humans are at least a couple or three orders of magnitude higher levels of antibodies than needed to protect it from challenge if you believe that this model um, replicates what's happening during natural infection. And so it was also then interesting to look at, well, at these low levels of antibodies, how does the vaccine protect? Is it the same mechanism or something different? And so at, when, we, when we transfer high volumes of serum, just a hundredfold dilution, you basically, it looks like the same thing as in a vaccinated animal, where you don't get basement membrane binding, you get this clumpy stuff that, that's binding to neutrophils, and you don't get any basement membrane binding. But at low levels, there's something different. We actually see binding the basement membrane, albeit maybe at lower levels. We see this conformational change to expose the L2, which is shown in the middle lower panel. But we never see stable acquisition um, by the keratinocytes. And so there could be two explanations for this. One is that while it's sitting on, the, on this um, basement membrane for hours, the neutrophils are still able to come in and gobble up. And incidentally, since these are points of trauma, these are also areas that are going to attract neutrophils and monocytes macrophages. Or the levels of antibodies needed to block cell surface association are just less than the number of antibodies needed per virus to block HSPG um, binding to the basement membrane. But in either way, it looks like there's a different mechanism of protection at low levels of antibodies. To conclude, we then went on and looked at what levels of antibodies were needed for protection in the in vitro neutralization assay, which we think mainly prevent, prevents infection by this binding, covering up the, the cell surface binding sites, and protection in vivo. And what this slide shows is that you can get protection in vivo at over 100-fold lower levels of antibodies than what you can get in vitro, despite the fact that in vivo we use more challenge virus than we do in vitro. So what this says is that clearly the in vitro assays are missing some potent mechanisms of infection that are happening in, vit in vivo. And we think th these may be due to this activity of these phagocytes. But because of this type of data, we basically believe that if you can detect antibody responses in women, they're going to be strongly protected from challenge um, from natural infection. So to conclude, the VLP vaccines are very effective at preventing virus infection for two main reasons. The VLP structure is exceptionally potent at inducing durable neutralizing antibody responses. And we think that, that this observation is actually going to be translatable to other future prophylactic vaccines. At this point, if you want to make a vaccine that induces consistent and durable high levels of antibodies, I think you almost have to try a virus-like display vaccine. And many, many vaccines now being developed are now using this principle um, in future generation vaccines. But the other reason is that the slow virus infection process makes it, in the fact that it has, has to initially bind sites of trauma, make it very susceptible to inhibition by antibodies. Now, this is going to be much less translatable to other viruses where they infect much more readily. But the revolt, we think that overall, the results provide a rationale for HPV VLPs being the first subunit vaccine that may be able to induce durable protection after a single dose and certainly inform development of other subunit vaccines. Thank you very much.